Hey friends, happy Thursday and welcome back to another virtual visit Facebook Live. Your screen is not deceiving you. Nick and I are reunited uh, back here on Facebook Live and we are pretty thrilled. And today we have a really cool animal to share with you. Um, right here in the tank in front of us is a type of salamander, a Mexican salamander called axolotls. They have some pretty incredible abilities um, and also one major challenge facing them in the wild. Uh, but before we get into that, I think Nick is going to start us off with a little bit of axolotl basics. Thank you, Taylor. And may I just say it is truly a pleasure to have the Tay-Nick combination <laughs> reunited again on Facebook. We're so excited to be here with you guys. We're also very excited to be together with each other. But we're really here for the axolotls. So we're let's also just... excited about axolotls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's let's focus on that for now. Okay. Uh, so uh, Taylor may have mentioned this. Uh, we are talking about an animal that is technically an amphibian. You guys can probably think of some other animals that are amphibians. Things like frogs, toads, and newts. They are all classified the same way. Um, typically, amphibians have a two-stage life cycle. And I'm going to hold up a graphic here that our camera person can zoom in on to help explain this a little bit. Basically, amphibians start their life out in an aquatic life phase. Eggs are laid in the water, and out from one of those eggs hatches basically a tadpole, a larval stage of an amphibian. Looks a little bit like this. Has a nice long swimming tail, doesn't have any limbs, has gills to be able to breathe in the water. The next thing that happens along this life stage is they actually start to grow their front pair of legs. And eventually they grow their back pair of legs. And this is where the second part of their life stage happens. Typically, amphibians will leave the water uh, and they will start to live on the land. And when that happens, they will lose any external gills that they might have. They'll lose the swimming part of their tail. They still have a long tail, but they lose the fin part or the caudal fin part of their tail. Uh, and they live on the land. Uh, salamanders go through this same two-stage life cycle. Uh, and you might be wondering, where do axolotls fit into all of this, particularly having uh, just seen a close-up view of them and what they look like and the fact that they're actually in a tank of water here. Um, this process of the two-stage two life stage um, that the amphibians go through, we refer to this as a metamorphic process or metamorphosis in that they change as they grow. Uh, Axolotls, that's actually not the case. Instead, they display something called neoteny, which basically means that they maintain the characteristics they had when they were very young. If you look really close, they can see that they still have the swimming part of their tail, and they still have those frilly external gills as well. Now, this is pretty wild because it turns out that axolotls are actually descended from terrestrial or land-dwelling salamanders, and so at some point, over evolutionary history, they must have moved back into the water and started living uh, strictly an aquatic life entirely. Now, you might be wondering, does this uh, uh, give them some sort of superpower or what does this mean about them that they're not actually completing their life cycle like other amphibians? Taylor's actually gonna tell us a little bit more about that. Taylor, take it away. Thanks, Nick. So uh, Nick gave it away a little bit. Because of this incomplete metamorphosis, axolotls do indeed have somewhat of a superpower. Now it's actually not unique to axolotls. All salamanders have this ability when they're young, but because axolotls never reach the end stage of metamorphosis, they keep this superpower for their entire life. So at this point, you're probably like, well, tell me what it is already. Um, it is called regeneration. Now, regeneration is the fancy science word for the ability to regrow body parts. And for salamanders, it's actually really impressive. They can regrow limbs. They can regrow organs, such as part of a stomach or part of their intestines. Um, they can also regrow parts of their brain and spine. So needless to say, medical scientists are pretty interested in exactly how axolotls do this because they actually share many of the same internal organs that humans have. And we would really love to know how to be able to allow humans to do this similar regenerative process. 
imagine people who need organ transplants or amputees or burn patients. They would all have the ability to heal their own bodies if we can figure out how axolotls do what they do. So scientists study axolotls that look like this one here. This picture might look a little familiar to you. I feel like this is usually the internet version of the axolotl that we've all come to know and love. But what they do is they inject this albino axolotl with something called GFP or green fluorescent protein. And essentially this is then what they look like. Now, why do they do this? Well, this actually makes axolotls glow in the dark. And by glowing, we can look at their cells at a really detailed level underneath super special microscopes, and we can watch their bodies start to repair themselves. And what we found out, not only can they regrow parts of their body, they will never scar, and they can accept transplants from other axolotls without any um, rejection, which is just, I think, pretty incredible. So we've learned a little bit about how they do this, and it has to do with a, a special set of cells that grow, a little bud that forms on the injured part. And those cells are really similar to stem cells, and they take on the characteristics of the cells around them and allow the animal to regrow that body part. Pretty incredible, right? So sounds pretty great to be an axolotl. What do you think, Nick? I'd like to... Uh, ask you to remind me to speak to you about that green fluorescent protein a little bit later. I think I would like to get my hands on some of that. Uh, it does sound pretty amazing to it be an axolotl amazing. tail. You're right. Yeah. There That's is a challenge that they're facing, however, particularly wild axolotls. So I think Nick's going to tell us a little bit about their challenges. She's right on. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Um, yes. Yeah, so this has to do with what's happening to axolotls in the wild. Um, even though they have this amazing superpower and they have so many other amazing characteristics, because they are an endemic species, which basically means that they are only found one place in the world, what that makes them vulnerable to is any changes to that habitat. And it turns out that there are some changes that have happened to the natural habitat of axolotls. So technically, in the wild, they're only found in one place outside Mexico City in Mexico, there's a series of lakes, and at the bottom of the graphic here, there are two lakes next to each other. One is called Lake Xochimilco. It took me about uh, a year to learn how to say that word properly. <laughs> and the other one is called Lake Chalco. Now, it turns out that uh, among these two lakes, which is, again, the only habitat where axolotls are found, uh, Chalco was actually recently drained completely to prevent flooding in the area. That leaves only Lake Xochimilco, and that lake has also been manipulated quite a, quite a bit and also drained to prevent flooding. In addition, um, the remaining water uh, has featured some introduced fish species, which have altered the ecology of axolotls. Um, and there's also been some pretty serious pollution in that area as well, which has really made it hard for them to live in their habitat. And this was sort of exemplified by the last set of scientists that went out in the wild to try to count axolotls, basically they only found two axolotls in the wild. Doesn't mean that there aren't more, but it is representative of the fact that their population is either very, very low or close to extinction, which is pretty tough. Fortunately, axolotls do very well in human care, in zoos and aquariums. They do very well in our care here at the aquarium. They're frequently found in research labs as well, like Taylor was just talking about too. Um, this sort of highlights the value of undiscovered species. There might be organisms out there living on planet Earth that we can learn a lot from, and we might not have even found them yet. In fact, there are about 8.7 million known species uh, on planet Earth, and more than an estimated 80% are still undiscovered according to scientists. So that's a large population that we think that we haven't even discovered or described yet. So how could we possibly know what kind of superpowers they have and what we could learn from them? Because of all this, we think it's really, really important to protect these animals, but also to protect the habitat where, we, where they live and where they're found. Now, we don't necessarily expect everyone to fly down to Mexico City uh, to take action to protecting that habitat, although we certainly wouldn't fault you if you felt inspired to do that. <laughs> I think Taylor is going to tell us a little bit more about things that we can do around here to help out. 
so one other lesson that axolotls teach us is actually something that is shared by amphibians. amphibians are known as something called an indicator species and this means that they indicate to humans about the health of their ecosystem. now why are amphibians such good indicator species? it actually has a little bit to do with their skin. So amphibians can actually breathe and drink right through the membrane of their skin. But this means they're really susceptible to things in the water. So if you remember, Nick just mentioned that the water in Lake Xochimilco became very polluted. And as a result, axolotls were absorbing that pollution right through their skin and populations rapidly declined. And this is true for amphibians no matter where in the world they're found. So even right in our own backyards. But because amphibians are such a good indicator species, it's a really good opportunity for us to step in and take action before the problem gets so bad that it's impacting animals at higher levels, including humans. So some ways that we can help look out for amphibians in our own backyards, there are a number of them. Um, and one of them is just making sure that you're keeping your backyard healthy for those amphibians. So if you think about some of the other things you might have in your backyard, think, grass and flowers and maybe this time of year some vegetable gardens these are areas that amphibians share with humans and areas that we typically do a little bit of intervention to help keep them green and lush so if you're using things like fertilizers and pesticides make sure that you're switching to alternative options that are natural options putting less chemicals introduced into their environment a really great um, type of fertilizer that you can get involved in is something called compost. Um, compost is, this is when all my grown-ups go, oh geez, yeah, compost is a lot of work and it's like a little stinky and I don't know if I want that in my backyard. But fortunately, there's a lot of community composting centers popping up. People looking to process waste in greener ways and including right here in the city of Boston. So just do a little bit of research you might actually be able to contribute to and get some really great compost for your backyard without having to do all the nitty gritty dirty work that it involves uh, in compost. Another really important thing that you can do for amphibians in your backyard and in, within your community is to vote with the environment in mind. Voting for legislation and policy makers that do things like set aside protected areas and help keep our practices greener um, is a really easy thing that you can do um, to help out our local amphibians. So there you have it, some ways you can help amphibians like our salamanders here, right in your own backyard here in Massachusetts, or maybe all the way down in Mexico City. So I think at this point, what we should do, Nick, is probably open up the floor to some questions. Axolotls are pretty interesting animals, so I suspect we may have one or two questions out there from our audience. Remember, if you want to ask a question, you can type it into the comments, and our lovely assistant, Marissa, will read them out to us today. Okay, if you guys do think of anything, again, post that question in the comments. We'll try to answer it live uh, right now. We'll give a couple more minutes for any questions that might come along. You may have noticed that among our population of three axolotls in the tank here, we actually do have one that's very differently colored. Uh, Taylor was talking about albino axolotls. This axolotl isn't technically albino, right, Taylor? This is actually a special color variant. I believe it's called leucistic. Yes. Is uh, the word that's used to describe this color variant. You'll notice that there is still a little bit of pigment. Uh, you can tell by looking at that whitish axolotl's eyes and its external gills. So that wild uh, coloration, the dark brown, is going to allow these animals to blend in really well in their environment, some excellent camouflage. So the white ones are exceptionally rare out in the wild because they usually end up as food for somebody at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, but in human care, you actually see a lot of these color variations. So not just the white or this slightly pinkish guy that we have in our exhibit, but also variations like orange and yellow and even purple, which are pretty common in the pet trade from what I understand. Interesting. We do have a couple questions. Awesome. Do they see color born in age five? Excellent question. Wow. Do they see color? They Is see that color? the question? Mm -hmm. mm. I don't I don't think they do, but I think that I'm just judging by Taylor's look. We <laughs> might we're a little bit stumped on that one. That's a great question. I don't believe that they see color, 
But I got to say that vision is one of those things that can sometimes be kind of hard to measure in animals. And we're still learning a lot about the, the uh, eyesight capabilities of things. Um, you know, this may sound like I'm avoiding the question, but just as an example, I think that for a long time scientists thought that all fish saw one way, but it turns out that we're learning that some fish have uh, excellent telescopic vision. Some can see shades a little bit better than others. Um, so it's quite possible that axolotls have a unique type of vision among amphib amphibians. Long story short, I don't think we're really sure. We're going to have to look that one up and get back to you. We can definitely look it up. I don't know enough about the eye structure of the axolotl to be able to answer that. I'm sure the information's out there because they are pretty heavily studied, again, for medical science. So we'll, we'll look it up. We'll get back to you. How long do axolotls live? That's another great question. So one of those perks of neoteny or that um, juvenile characteristics that the axolotl has is it actually extends their life as well. So we think axolotls live somewhere between 15 to 20 years, which is much longer than other salamander counterparts of similar size and geographic range. Um, Scientists have also found out that if you expose axolotls to high levels of iodine, this is actually one of the chemicals that triggers the end stage of metamorphosis. So it actually fakes out an axolotl's body into thinking it's time to hit the end stage of metamorphosis. They will lose their frilly gills and that caudal fin move onto land, but this also means they don't live as long. So we actually do in fact know that um, neoteny extends their life, which is pretty cool. Aha, what do they eat? Yes. So, uh, apologies for the technical difficulties there. Hopefully you guys are still tuned in. I was answering a question about what axolotls eat. I mentioned some of the things they eat in the wild. They're technically omnivores. Here at the aquarium, we feed them a couple things primarily. We feed them Bloodworms, which are a very small species of worm. We also feed them special axolotl pellets, which Taylor just informed me <laughs> are mostly made up of ground up flies. Yes, you heard that correctly. <laughs> but also lots of important vitamins and minerals that animals need like axolotls to be able to survive. Using pellets like that, it's not necessarily something we use with all of our animals, but it is a way to deliver important nutrients and vitamins um, to them as part of their diet that are necessary for them to stay healthy. So, excellent. Excellent questions. Any other questions, Marissa? Melina wants to know, do they change colors like chameleons? Ah, Great very question. good question. Do they change colors like chameleons? So despite what it may look like in our tank here, axolotls do not change color. They pretty much stay consistently the same color that they are their entire lives. So the difference in color, again, has to do with genetics, uh, genetic quirk that makes this axolotl not be able to bind pigment in his skin. And that's why our, our white axolotl is white and our other axolotls are dark brown. So they don't necessarily change color, although they can come in different colors. Kind of like, I, well, I was gonna say my hair is a different color from Nick's hair, but you can't really tell that by looking at Nick right now. <laughs> what would be a Taylor Nick presentation without a mention of my bald head? <laughs> Do we have any other questions this morning, Marissa? Awesome. Well, again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Apologies for the technical difficulties here in our concrete building. Thanks for bearing with us. We hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about these amazing creatures. Again, this is an animal that typically lives behind the scenes here at the aquarium, but we do bring them out for live animal presentations. So it's not impossible that you would see them on a trip here to the aquarium. If you have additional questions, stick them in the comments. We'll answer them for you. And we hope you all have an awesome day. Thanks, friends. Tune in again. We'll see you soon.